It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 329 of Science on Top. Today is Monday, the 1st of April, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hi, Ed. And I'm so excited to welcome someone whose academic work focused on classical studies and archaeology, in particular mythology and theatre and using entertainment to bring the ancient world to the people. Chris Curtin McGee, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. It is so great to have you on. I'm really looking forward to talking with you all about Herodotus, the father of history, as some have called him, and the extraordinary discovery in an Egyptian ruin. But first, a quick reminder for everyone to go to scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us make the show. Just a few dollars each episode will be a big help to keep us going. And don't forget, there are also still a few free tickets left to see Sean Elliott's comedy festival show, Tesla, Death Rays and Elephants, at the Imperial Hotel in Melbourne all this month on the weekends. So get in quick, just send us an email, feedback at scienceontop.com, and let us know which date you want to go, and then you and a friend can go and have a laugh and learn something. Feedback at scienceontop.com. Okay, Chris, I mentioned before Herodotus, known as the father of history. Mm. Now, do you want to give us a quick summary of who he was and why? I think it was Cicero who first called him that, the father of history. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was Cicero. So Herodotus is an historian from the 5th century BCE and he was... Not the first historian. In fact, as far as we know, there were at least seven before him, but he is the first one whose work we have in anything more than tiny little fragments. Uh, And he is, we believe, the first historian to actually use history to, to actually inquire about history, about the whys behind things. So before that, there would just be... Uh, historical documents that would say this happened and then this happened Mm. and then this happened and then this happened. He's the one who started saying this happened and I think it might have happened because that year there was no rain or something. He was the first Mm. one to actually start to inquire as to why things happened. He particularly looked a lot at the Persian, the war between the Persians and the Greeks. He was a Greek himself, but he was actually born and raised in uh, the Persian Empire. So he looked at the background and into why things happened between them because he wanted to understand exactly, I think, where things were going to go between those two um, states. So that was his big uh, contribution that is something that we don't even think of now. That is just obviously something that happens with history. It's not just reporting of historical dates, dates. and so forth. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely something that now he did have uh, his issues. He did. Yeah, he he was when you're the first doing something. Obviously, you're going to have things that later on don't look so great. So he is probably the father of the. Yeah, the man in the pub told me kind of source. Um, you know, at least he, he was would name quoting them. his sources. I could acknowledge Yes, he, he would. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it would be, oh, okay, well, this bloke in the pub told me this. And, yeah. Uh, and to be fair, a lot of the things that he has been ridiculed for over history, including these, uh, these barrasses, these boats, have actually been found later that he was correct or at least sort of correct. So, right. so he, a, he he's had, also he's also been mocked as the father of lies in like yes yeah yeah that's a I think that's Gibbon. Plutarch, I can't remember who said it? that yeah. yeah. So he used to describe boats and and the manufacturer of these Egyptian boats um, called Barrisons. Yeah. is that right? 
Yeah, yeah. So he described these boats that were used to go up and down the Nile and were used for um, mostly for transporting cargo to different emporiums. Uh, so they weren't sort of seagoing ships. They were just along the river. And he described them and nothing like them had ever been seen before. Uh, sorry, mm. when I said like that had ever been seen before. Uh, nothing the, like that yeah. had, had ever been found since yeah. until now. So what it is basically was that he was describing a a ship that was constructed in a completely different way to any other ship that he'd ever seen before. Um, it was to do with the ribbing on the inside of the hull of the ship, so the ways that the sort of, I guess you'd call it like the skeleton of the ship yep. was built and they were really long some of them were almost two meters long and then they were fastened Planks. together with pegs yeah yeah they were called um henans yeah so they were brought together they were fastened together with pegs and then there was circular openings at the bottom for a steering oar to be put through like a rudder to steer the ship mm-hmm. and they have now found this ship that is the only real big difference between the ship that he describes and this ship is that the ship that they found is bigger. So okay. if that's the only major difference, uh, it and suggests also, that actually he knew what he was talking about. And mm. those measurements could have just been his sort of estimation, maybe from a distance even. They or could have been. Oh, if someone's yeah. retelling it to him, maybe, yeah. But yeah, yeah. That's No, that's very cool. And I just love it when... There's a fable or a story that we've all just dismissed throughout time as being nonsense. Mm. And then there's some little discovery, yeah. or in this case, a yeah. pretty big discovery, that just goes, nah, turns out it was actually right. I also just think it's pretty extraordinary that this one site, uh, I mean, it, it was obviously it was a port city, but to find mm-hmm. 70 vessels, 70 mm. boats there, I mean, that must be a wealth of information that you can gather from that sort of a thing, not just about building techniques and all that, but there'd be items of culture and cargo and things yeah. on that as well. Yeah, it's definitely. Well, yeah, I mean, it was the harbour, so I don't know what they think with this ship uh, in particular. It would have been at the end of its life because they think it's actually a 6th century ship. So when... Um, when Herodotus saw it, it would have been the 5th century. Uh, so this one, they think what would have happened is that after it was no longer seaworthy or river worthy, mm-hmm. it would have become like a floating jetty oh, okay. in the harbour. Yeah. Oh, wow. So they, I think I'm not quite sure how they have figured that out, possibly because of the bits that are missing mm-hmm. from it um, or from where it was found. But, yeah, they, they suspect that it became that they basically would have just used it because I guess that that's a perfectly yeah yeah well it's a lot of timber that you didn't you wouldn't want to just rip out so yeah uh let's stick with the uh, archaeological theme penny because we've talked a few times on the show about how and when humans first came to Australia and I think the most widely accepted notion is that it was around 60,000 years ago island hopping down through Indonesia mm. But now investigations at an ancient, well, it's a trash pile, basically, a midden near the Victorian coastal town of Warrnambool could potentially double that time frame to 120,000 years ago. That's pretty cool. I think this is really interesting. And it's one of those studies where we're either going to have to, well, you know, eventually it's not going to be evidence of human occupation or we're actually going to have to rethink the whole out of Africa timeline because if you're talking about humans, you know, using fire and doing stuff near Warrnambool, which is, you know, the south coast of Australia 120,000 years ago, that is incredibly ancient and, you know, it really means a big look at, um, you know, who was coming out of Africa and when and the multi-regional hypothesis and all sorts of things. It reminds me a bit of the, you know, the claims that there have been people found, you know, right in the south end of South America are quite ancient as well. And I know that those claims have been dismissed, but it just seems that there's, 
there's just these suggestions and hints of evidence around that the picture might not be as neat as always as we're thought to. <laughs> we, we think it might be. We think we've kind of got it down, but it, it, it's just yeah. worth considering other options and this is one of them. It's an interesting site. Um, as Ed said, it's a midden site, which is essentially um, like a landfill where people would chuck sort of the remains of fish, crabs, shellfish and so on. There's also charcoal blackened stones and so on so evidence of fire there but what's really interesting this is this site has been firmly dated at around um, 120,000 years ago it's really old so this is from dating the shells the burnt stones the sands around it and so on what's less obvious is that whether or not this is indisputably evidence of humans being there so there's no tools found there yet there's no bones there's you know no bones with scratches in them or anything that you can say yes that had to have been made by a human and I think that um the burden of proof you know it does need to be there because it is so out of sync with the real current understanding that's not to say this site should be dismissed on the contrary it seems like it should be taken extremely seriously but just looking for evidence of human occupation there is really, really important. Um, it looks in many ways um, to be cultural. The shells look like, you know, Aboriginal middens that have been found at more recent, you know, like only 65,000 years ago or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, the burnt patches of rocks look like they could be hearts. Like it does in many ways look like... A human site but because it's so old it, you know it's also not unreasonable to interpret it as a natural accumulation of you know shellfish and blackening which can happen you know it could be like a tree stump that's set on fire or mm. even algae can cause rocks to blacken so it's it's just not clear yet but the suggestion is there and it's a serious enough suggestion to investigate further and to pay attention to that this could be this could almost double our understanding of how long people have been living in Australia and if they were in if humans did indeed you know or if these were made by anatomically modern humans and they came out of Africa then all sorts of timelines are going to have to be really reconsidered because to get from um, you know, down to the south, southernmost bits of Australia is no short feat either. So if they were there 120,000 years ago, then it's possible that habitation in north, you know, the north of Australia was even earlier than that. Yeah. So plus, I, I mean, think it requires, yeah. Sorry, like, as far as we know, I think with the out of Africa hypothesis, I guess we can almost call it a theory really, but we ha that has humans getting to sort of East Asia around a hundred and a hundred thousand years ago. Yeah, yeah. So that means they were probably there earlier than that. If they were to then get down to South mm. Australia, that's yeah. Uh, rewriting history books completely, if it's true, and we need to keep in mind that this is not conclusive yet, but it's it's fascinating. It is, and I want to end with a quote. One of the um, archaeologists was actually an old lecturer of mine, Ian McNiven. And his quote that he has said about it is something I really agree with. He said, it can't be left hanging. It's just too important. So we have to throw all the science we can at it. Yeah. So, you know, I think to me that, yeah, it's really, really interesting. I've always been interested in, you know, human history and human evolution and something like this. You know, and I'm going to be honest, like in my own backyard, yeah. almost, is quite exciting that, that an Australian site could be really, really important to understand in terms of, you know, the big picture of the human race. I just like that it's another story where, you know, for a long time we've thought one thing mm. and a new potential piece of evidence suggests that something completely different is the case. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, so exciting. Okay, now, last up. Let's talk a bit about magnetoreception. Now, we know a lot of animals can sense magnetic fields. You get your migratory birds, 
baby turtles even when finding the ocean when they hatch, honeybees, fish, uh, even domestic chickens, I believe, can sense the Earth's magnetic field. But humans? Well, until now, we didn't think so. And Penny, a new study suggests that we can sense magnetic fields, but at an unconscious level. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because I think I remember we talked about magnetic sensors a while ago on Science on Top Ed, and I remember being just very confused about the whole thing, even though I did mm. my best. Um, but it's always been something that, well, you know, humans can't sense. Like no one that we know has a conscious ability to sense magnetic fields. I mean, obviously there's a whole lot of sort of semi-woo or 100% woo kind of therapies and so on involving magnets. Like it seems a bit of a, not can of worms, but, you know, humans on the whole scientifically are not considered to be sensitive to, you know, magnetically sensitive. But this study was really, really interesting. They essentially, and I don't know if I can fully explain this, they made essentially a modified Faraday cage or a modified room, which basically kind of meant that um, they had control of the magnetic field in that room. And we all live in a magnetic field and it's, you know, it's going to be angled at a different you know, have a different angle depending on where we are in, at, in the earth. But also, you know, even in relation to that field, whenever we move our head or move, our bodies move in relation to that field. So even though it's not something that, um, that we are aware of, you know, if we did have a magnetic sense, we would be able to say, well, yes, the head is moving. The magnetic field is, we're moving in relation to it, if that makes sense. But as you know, when none of us are aware of that, we don't really mm. seem to have an obvious magnetic sense. We can't say, oh, you know, move your head and see if you've moved something else. Because if you do move your head, a whole lot of other kind of body systems go into place, the ones that kind of let us know where we are in space. So what this study did is essentially sit the subject in terms of their perception in a darkened room where nothing happened for an hour. But what was actually happening was the magnetic field in that room was being moved around and the theory was that if the magnetic field moved around even if the person the subject wasn't aware of it consciously there could be responses in their brain brain waves that might indicate that at some level it was be being sensed because you can't respond to something unless it can be detected mm. so they moved the magnetic field up and down as if it would move the way as if it was moving as if you were moving your head you know moving around in space they also moved it in unnatural directions so, so ways that you just wouldn't really experience on earth and what they found is that a lot of people just didn't respond at all their brainwave um brainwaves didn't respond or didn't change at all um no one at all was aware of what was happening with the magnetic field. Mm. But what is interesting is that some of the test subjects had alpha waves in their brains that shrank to half their normal size after a shift. So oh. it seems that some people have on some level the ability, I shouldn't even say ability, just the capacity maybe that their brain is something is happening. They're detecting something changing when that magnetic field shifts and some response is happening in their brain. And that's really, really interesting. I mean, what does it mean? Like maybe some ancestor of ours had a magnetic sense and there's some vestige of that left behind, in which case, I mean, I would love to know the mechanism. I mean, could people who have this tiny little remnant sense be trained to use it it seems like this seems like you know the prologue mm. to like a semi-trashy young adult novel in a way <laughs> but it's just I find it really interesting it's a really interesting question can people sense magnetism and it's a really interesting answer because the you know anyone who's sensing something like that it's going to be at a very very unconscious level mm. and I mean I don't know if that experiment would be able to be repeated or critiqued, you know. Well, I think we should also note that it was a small percentage of people who could detect it. I think it was 34 participants and only four of them showed the response. 
which is so, really small, but I mean, it still happened. Yeah. Yeah. I just look, I don't actually have anything. I think it's probably obvious to say <laughs> about this research other than I'm just really fascinated by it. And it, yeah, it's very interesting. Mm. It needs to be reproduced and oh, maybe sure. with a broader sample size or whatever. Um, there's definitely a lot of room for fine tuning. Um, and I, and I hate to say it, but this could potentially, if it's true, give some credence to people who say, uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation affects my brain mm. and all that sort of stuff. You know, I'm sensitive to Wi-Fi and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's no cut and dried evidence to suggest there's anything to be concerned about there, but maybe for a very tiny percentage of the population, yeah. they may feel something on a very subconscious level. Who knows? Who knows? Um, more research needed, as we yeah. always say. But, uh, yeah, it's always interesting. And I just like that it's a, a pretty rigorous um, experiment. They were pretty careful to rule out any other factors. It's a mm. darkened room. I'd be interested to know if the participants were told to think about anything or what they were th if th thinking they were there for. You know, yeah. just sit here and do nothing for an hour in a dark room. Mm, uh, I know. Okay. It's pretty <laughs> yeah. That. Very interesting, and we'll see if uh, it gets reproduced and if anything further mm. comes from that. But I think that wraps up our show. And as always, you can find all the links that we talked about in the show notes and on the web, scienceontop.com slash 329. Don't forget, email feedback at scienceontop.com uh, to let us know if you want to go and see Tesla, Death Rays and Elephants, Sean Elliott's Melbourne International Comedy Festival show. Uh, let us know what dates, and uh, we'll see if we can put you on the list if there's still tickets available. And, of course, scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us make the show. Chris, Kurt, and McGee, it has been so interesting, and we've had so much fun having you on the show. Oh, thank you. And, of course, Penny, it's always great to talk with you. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week with Science on Top of the Agenda. Join us then. By framing the book as an enquiry, Herodotus allowed it to contain many different stories, some serious, others less so. He recorded the internal debates of the Persian court, but also tales of Egyptian flying snakes giant gold-digging ants, and practical advice on how to catch a crocodile. However, modern evidence has actually explained some of his apparently extreme claims. For instance, there's a species of marmot in the Himalayas that spreads gold dust while digging. The ancient Persian word for marmot is quite close to the word for ant, so Herodotus may have just fallen prey to a translation error.